good. <laughs> we are on day nine of our 20 city bus trip through the state of Texas, big and beautiful and diverse. And so maybe it's appropriate for me to have the last stop right here in Austin at my alma mater. Hook 'em horns! Thank you, and I know I see some folks who may have been in pharmacy school with me. They're the great ones who know how to use a slide rule. Thank you so much, and thank you to the students. Let me tell you, my heart goes out to our university Dems and the great leadership David is doing with all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. And to Jan, who is the perfect example of what our chairs do on each county as I've traveled. I visited with so many county chairs and they all asked me, do you know Jan? Do you know? Thank you so much, Jan. You're a great job that you're doing. And what can I say about your newest state representative, a woman that I've known since the well, should, I, should we tell them? Till the, since the late 80s, early 90s, your own. She is fabulous. She is going to represent you so well. Celia Israel. Oh, Celia. Thank you so much. Well, as I told you, we are, we are at that point in time where we have finished this bus tour. And I was joined on that bus tour by members of our family by folks from the Texas Democratic Party, by teachers, by small business people, by folks from Annie's List who helped us. Uh, I know they're out here too. And, and young people and oh, oh my goodness. We had, if you can think about it, fun on the bus. Now this bus was not one that you would think has those nice lounge chairs or sofas. All it had was computer workstations all through each side and a little table in the back that you could work and have conference because it was a working tour. But most of all, I went to listen. You know, I graduated from the University of Texas in 1979 as a proud pharmacist for 33 years. I know what I do best across the prescription counter is to listen. And that's what I did. I listened to Texans all across this state. And so in Alice, Texas, I listened. Uh, oh, we got some folks from Alice. From Alice, all right, Jim Wells and Duval County, that whole area. I listened to farmers and ranchers and small business people. And they think, what is their state doing for education, for our public schools, for our higher education institutions? And boy, are they concerned about the drought and water and transportation. Then on to the valley in McAllen and Far and Laredo. And the one message there was, why are they demonizing us? Why are they talking about us in such harsh terms? Don't they know about the economic development? Don't they know that trade with Mexico is $720 million a day? Don't they know that that harsh rhetoric is costing us jobs? And don't they know that it hurts our families, our abuelitas and our primas, when they say things as awful as invasion and to suggest that we come with diseases like leprosy? And as we were in McAllen, Oh, coming out of that Barnes and Noble, going off to Starbucks to get that latte. They said, is that a third world country? No, I think not. The real concerns were economic. And they're hurt, and they're disgusted, and they're angry that their area of this state, such a vibrant part, would be used just as a political pawn to get a couple of more votes. And when we visited, with veterans in Laredo and El Paso. They told us about the needs to redouble our efforts to help those returning integrate back into civilian life and to get jobs. They shouldn't have to fight to get a job after they've been fighting for us overseas. Absolutely. 
And in El Paso, again, talking about, wait a minute, we're the safest city here. We are so safe. Why do they talk about us in Austin and those folks that want to get votes with such harsh terms? Don't they know about El Paso? Thinking that they've been forgotten, neglected, and worse, insulted. Those veterans there talk to me about housing and about reintegration and their worry about their kids, particularly the women veterans who have children. We went on to West Texas, to Midland, Lubbock, and Wichita Falls, where the sign, oh, we got some West Texas folks out here, where at a time you'd think you'd be seeing political signs for candidates along the barbed wire fences, along the storefronts of the mom and pop shops, and in yards that were brown with this drought. Theirs was one sign that was consistent, pray for rain. They wonder why a state government has taken decades to act about security and water projects. And they're just days away from having to maybe truck in some fresh water for their folks to drink. They wonder why has their state abandoned them with a promise of at least keeping up their roads shoving the responsibility of our roads and highways to the local elected officials, Mike Martinez, right? To the local elected officials. They wonder where the priorities are. And as we visited in Houston and in Dallas, it was with small businesses who said, you know, there's a lot being done from businesses that have it pretty good already. What about us? And they complained about the franchise tax in this state that is discriminatory to small business. And they said, what happened to higher ed? And you know why? 10 years ago, the business community, the legislature, and our higher ed community, all on the same page. All on the same page. We were trying to find ways to have more nationally recognized institutions of higher education, more tier one institutions. And boy, that was the discussion in Lubbock. That was the discussion in Houston. What happened? Dallas, what, what, what happened with higher ed? Weren't we supposed to get more? Absolutely, because you know, and I know, and smart business people know that the innovations and the programs, the learning that happens at our tier one institutions spark the economy. Give birth to your creative minds that are gonna go out and have new products and services, new research, new and better ways to get things done. They said, I think the business leadership is still there. What's happened to the legislature? What's happened to our leaders? Why is it that they brag about the billion plus cuts that they did in 2011 to our universities? Why is it that they're bragging about cuts? In East Texas, visiting in Tyler and Lufkin and Nacogdoches, again, a feeling of, why is it that we're not putting that investment in higher ed? And they complained about tuition. They said, well, didn't the legislature used to set that? And I said, well, they did. And when the legislature set tuition, it gave us a lot of impetus because we didn't want that complaint. So we actually funded higher education and the needs of our campuses. But now, pushing it off on the regents, not funding higher education and the infrastructure we need for economic success, it puts pressure on those regions. And guess what's happened to tuition? Well, I don't have to tell you about tuition and fees, even at this wonderful university that I love. But in East Texas, they were talking about the same thing, about highways. And they also mentioned, hey, are you ever going to find a solution to get us those federal dollars so that we can actually have some health care insurance? Right? Wondering what happened in Austin. Is it a just say no mentality? And then we went on to Houston and visited businesses and students and our veterans again. But in Houston, the complaint was we're so congested in traffic. Don't they know in Austin that when we're 45 minutes to and from work or school, that's an hour and a half that we are not with our families? And employers knowing 
that if you're stuck in congestion, you can't get your products to the retailer, to the wholesaler. That's unproductive and it's costing us dollars. What happened when we used to be the state that bragged about our highway system? And as we ended up in Corpus Christi, the feeling again that, do they really know what's happening here with small businesses? Do they really know that we need a concentration on our water systems? Here we are, a coastal town. Are they gonna put in money? Are we gonna get maybe a desalinization plant? Because they know if you don't have the water, you're not gonna have jobs. And then here today, meeting with teachers, meeting with those precious teachers that absolutely form the pipeline so that the students can come here. Those teachers who are spending out of their own pocket for supplies because they don't want their students to go without. And they asked, what about that discussion? They said, you know, we've heard about the other, you know, people that are running for lieutenant governor, but what's their education plan besides vouchers? I said, I don't know. That's all they're talking about. Whether you call it a tax credit or not, it's still a scheme of vouchers. And it would take away precious resources from our public schools. The discussion ought to be not about vouchers. It ought to be of how we value teachers, making sure that they are free to teach and our students are free to learn, not burdened. That's what it's about. It's about being Texas, where opportunities are here for all of us. And as I see your faces, I see that hope and enthusiasm. I see the hopes of your parents, and I see the prayers of your grandparents. My family's here, and I want to bring them up. My mom, Belle, retired educator. Mama, come on up. My sisters, Annabelle and Roseanne. My cousin, Paul. Come on up, Paul, another student. And the sweetie of my life, the guy who we've been, well, we've been together, I think, 36 years. We're fixing to be 37. Our six children and now almost six nearly perfect grandchildren, Pete Vandepute. Our family has been with us on this trip. Well, they took turns. They took turns. Not everybody was there all the time. But my family is not any different from your family. And from the concerns of veterans who understand that our family, with my mom and the uncles serving in World War II, or Pete's dad above in World War II in the Pacific at, on the USS Southampton at Iwo Jima, and our cousins in Vietnam, and me being born in an army base hospital during the Korean War. Okay, I'm a Texan, but I was born on an army base at Fort Lewis, Tacoma, Washington. And now, today, we pray for the next generation, our nephew, who's on another tour today in Afghanistan. Those veterans wonder, where's the promise? Those teachers are saying, are we valued? And heartbreaking for small business people who are the lifeblood of this state and the economy. You know, the types that are buying the football program ads on Friday nights. You know, the ones that are involved back home in your commissions and task force, all in cities and counties. You know, the folks that are involved in their churches and their faith-based institutions. They're wondering, what about us? And so, as we embarked on this, I heard loud and clear that what people want from their leaders is to focus on the priorities. Focus on problem solving, not partisan pettiness and politics that absolutely paralyze like what we sometimes see in Washington, D.C. They want a Texas and a leader that has a can-do spirit, that's not afraid of the challenges, that gets people in a room, all types of viewpoints, both parties, because it's our Texas. And we know 
that when you get Texans together, oh, you know it, even in the toughest of times, we do the best. That's our Texas. And it's a Texas for all, not just a select few. Well, And so let me tell you, I know there are a lot of active Democrats out here. Oh, no. There, let me tell you, folks are giving us a look. At almost every single location, there were folks who would say, I'm a Republican, but I'm coming over and vote for you, Leticia. they have concerns and they wonder what has happened. Now, they're not all the way. They said, I'm taking the R off. I don't know if I'm putting the D on yet. So as Democrats, I want us to all embrace these folks who are understanding our true values and what we're focused on is the opportunity that's always been Texas. Not the issues that divide us, but the issues that make us stronger when we focus on what's right for Texas. I want to thank all of you who came today, and I want to thank all of them, every single one, from that rancher and farmer, the small business person, the teacher, the students, the very astute technology business owner, everyone that we met, everyone that came to hear kind of what I have to say, but more, more impressed with that I wanted to listen to them. This was a tough decision for our family, for me to run. You see, I, I never really saw myself as being anything but the state senator from San Antonio. And I, I really am humbled and honored and proud to have been that senator. But when I kept hearing what the other four guys at the time, now it's down to two, were saying, that's not the Texas that Pete and I have built our family. That's not the Texas for my grandchildren. And so as we gathered everyone together, much like how we gathered everybody together 23 years ago in the decision to run for state representative where our little daughter said, oh, why does mama want to be a state representative? <laughs> and it was because my daughter said, because there's not enough mommies there. That's right. Not enough mommies there. We still have a lot of work to do on that. And as we have our family meetings, my daughter, who answered that question, is now a practicing OBGYN, who, by the way, just keeps saying, why don't they just trust women? Why don't they just trust women? Well, we had another family meeting about what it would mean to our family if Mama would do this, would run for lieutenant governor. And so I explained to my children what I was feeling and what I was feeling because we had a really hard year. And I didn't know if I could put my family through that. And they said, we're strong, Mom. We're strong. And it's important but why is it? And I said, because I'm not happy. <laughs> I'm just not happy. And so if your family's anything like my family, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. That's right. Ain't nobody happy. But you know, if grandma ain't happy, if grandma ain't happy, run, run. And so I am, I'm running to be your next Lieutenant Governor. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you to you.